There we go. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Are you having a good time so far at WordCamp Boston? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for making it. So, welcome to the talk. Uh, let's just remember what this is called. Optimizing WordPress for speed and scale. My name is Ben Metcalf. It says it there. I have to take my lanyard off, so just make sure that's me. Um, I'm the co-founder of WP Engine, which is a managed WordPress hosting platform. However, this talk is not about WP Engine, this is not a sales pitch, forget that. What we're talking about here is if you're not running your site on WP Engine, if you're running it somewhere else, how can you make your site uh, perform in a way that will be uh, faster, more optimized, so that you can have more visitors, so that you don't go down in uh, a spike of traffic, things like this. So this is about your site where you're running right now, and this is not about WP Engine. Just want to say that from the beginning. Um, however, I will just quickly mention, just a sales pitch now, uh, that WP Engine, in terms of why I'm here and why I can talk about this, we host uh, the blogs and sites of 35,000 plus domains, including big companies that you may have heard of like this. Um, and so we've been doing that for about two years. This month is actually our two year anniversary of being available to the public. And uh, many of our clients have uh, hundreds of millions of hits a month. So that's why hopefully uh, I, have, I can talk on this subject. However, so we get back into the uh, presentation. Before I begin, one of the things that I'm really interested in finding out from the audience, from you guys, is how many WordPress sites you run and also where you run them. I'm just always curious to get a temperature of the audience. So starting off with WordPress, how many people here, put your hand up if you run at least one WordPress site, and that's a self-installer bar. Okay, keep your hand up if you have two or more. Three or more, five or more, 10 or more, 20 or more, 50 or more. Put your hand down if you're running a WordPress hosting site or, or um, a, a platform or a company, like hosting business. Okay, so some of you have more than 100, and some of you do, 200. Okay, some of you are running crazy amounts of WordPress, that's awesome. Okay, um, and then secondly, so there's lots of different places where you can obviously run WordPress from shared hosting through to your own servers. How many people, and you're, you, you might be running it in more than one place, uh, some of your WordPress sites, but how many people here have WordPress running on a shared hosting environment? Put your hand up. Okay, how many people here are running BPSs for WordPress? How many people here have uh, bare metal servers, like full dedicated servers? Okay. How many people here run on a managed WordPress hosting platform like WP Engine, Pagely, Zippy Kid, Web Synthesis? Okay. And then how many people here run on Amazon EC2? One person. Okay. Well, at the end, I'll tell you why that's a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. And so just to continue before we get into the presentation, the idea of this is I'm going to start from the absolute bare minimums and go all the way through to some really crazy things you could do if you were running hundreds and hundreds of millions of, of hits a month. My guess is you're somewhere in between. So I'm going to start off really basic and you'll be like, yeah, Ben, we already know this. And then hopefully they'll come a point with some ideas and you'll be like, oh, that's something I, I should be trying. That's something new. And then there'll come a point where I might lose you. But the idea is that everyone's probably at different levels. So if I start on that spectrum and make my way through, hopefully you can pick something up uh, and go away and investigate it. Because of time, I can't go into a lot of detail on any of these things necessarily. They're all little ideas that you would want to go away and do yourself. Towards the end, they're going to require SSH. How many people here have SSH access on their accounts? Okay. And how many people here feel confident using SSH? Okay. Well, we'll talk about that when we get to it. But uh, the other thing I always say is uh, SSH, you can do great things and you can do bad things. And of course, I and the organizers of this conference and WPN are not liable for anything you do on your SSH account, okay? Use caution. Okay, so let's get going. So, we're here to talk about WordPress optimization, but why would we want to optimize our WordPress account? Well, for a start, why not? Like, optimizing, that sounds great, huh? Um, secondly, whether your blog or your website is used just for reading, and so it's just for uh, publishing and you have readers, or whether you're in commerce and you're ultimately using it to sell something, you want to keep those people happy. So if they come along and the site's down, that doesn't seem like, like that's going to be a good, a good situation. Also, if you're under heavy load, 
because you know you go on Oprah. Well, I guess that example's not valid anymore because she doesn't do her site her um, program. But if if you if you're on a, uh, a TV show or you have an advertising or something like that, and suddenly lots of people are going to come to your site and you go down, that's bad. And also, it can save you money optimizing. We've all probably had experiences, or, or, or many of us, where our web host will say, hey, your site's using too much uh, uh, resources, you need to go to the next tier, you need to pay us some more money. Well, sometimes if you optimize, you keep yourself below that tier, and essentially you're saving yourself money by not having to buy the next package up. So I'm going to do these in levels, just because I said some of them are very easy, some of them are very hard and complicated to set up. So we'll start off with the basics. First of all, keep WordPress up to date. Now, everyone here keeps WordPress up to date, don't they? There's no one here that isn't running anything less than 3.4, is that right? Anyone here running any version below 3.4? Anyone here running anything below 3? Oh dear, you can just leave the room now. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, honestly, seriously, please keep your WordPress up to date for security reasons and features anyway, but actually quite often there's optimizations in the code and so if you uh, continue to keep your WordPress up to, uh, up to date, you're going to keep it optimized as programmers uh, contributing to core, you know, improve the efficiency of the code. The next one is running a caching plugin, which is very basic of all things. How many people here run a caching plugin? How many people here don't know what a caching plugin is? Okay, a couple of people. So, as a very basic idea, if someone comes to your site, and they say, Brett, I want to load the front page of your blog or your site. The web service is great. Like, it's a WordPress site. I'm going to load up PHP. I'm going to load up PHP. I'm now going to load up the WordPress. I'm going to talk to the database. I'm going to pull that stuff out of the database. I'm going to pull the page together. And then I send it to the, the, the person visiting your site. The next person that comes along a second later, requesting the same page, they're going to do all that again. Well, that seems very inefficient. What if we could just take the resultant page that was created the first time save it somewhere, and when the next person comes along, eh, we'll just save, we'll just give them that as well. And we don't have to go through all that other stuff that we just went through. That at the fundamental level is what caching is about. And so plugins, such as W3 Total Cache, and there's also W3 Super Cache, and Back Cache, which is what they are on WordPress.com, do a number of different functions. Many of them are like Swiss Army. But one of the fundamental things they'll do is that basic level of caching. You install it, you activate it, and it's done. Sorry. And so you don't have to think about it. You can get in there and play around with it, but you don't have to. Oh, yeah. Different plugins uh, all kind of do the same things here, but the W3 Total Cache is a lot more advanced in terms of different options and things that you can do. And some of the stuff I'm going to talk about will, um, will uh, rely on W3 Total Cache. So it's one I recommend. Whatever you do, if you, try, if you play around and you want to uh, uh, check out different ones, don't run more than one at once. It's a bad idea. Anyone remember Ghostbusters and they crossed the streams? It's a bit like crossing the streams, like we don't want to. If you're under 25, you probably have no idea what um, Deactivate unused plugins. Uh, so if you've got plugins, I bet when, I, when you go into your plugin section, there's loads of plugins there that you're not using. WP Engine, we see customers with 100 plugins, and we're like, you don't need all these plugins. Um, deactivate the ones you don't need. And even the, the, the entirely. Uh, every plugin you deactivate is going to help just that little bit more. I'm going the wrong way on my button. I should stand over here. And then I would use to uh, push the other button. There we go. Avoid bad plugins. So these plugins here are just a couple, are just a flavor of some of the plugins that we see uh, in the wild that don't run very well. If, you, if you've written any of these plugins or you know people who've written these plugins, we would love to help you improve them. You know, we will help you. But basically, some of the things to think about some of these plugins that are bad. Backing up your WordPress, that's a good thing. But if backing up your WordPress is going to take down your site or make your web server really slow off it does that, that's bad. And if you're on a shared web host, uh, a, a shared server, everyone else on that, on, on that server is also having to suffer while that backup occurs. So there's other ways of backing up WordPress that are better. Um, broken link checker. If you're going to check for broken links, there are other ways of doing it from your computer or from another server. Doing it within WordPress doesn't make sense because you might have non-WordPress links in there on your site. And also, it's, again, using up a lot of processing stuff. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm um, happy to talk about them. But basically, 
plugins that might take your site down or you notice the site running very slowly for the duration of while they're running, like a backup type plugin, you probably want to think about what that's doing to anyone who's just coming to visit your site while that's going on. Review your theme. Um, I would say about a third of all the optimizations I've seen people achieve is basically just HTML and PHP in the theme itself. Typically, if you down, down, downloaded it from somewhere and maybe the person who programmed it wasn't entirely knowing what they were doing. So, you know, as it says there, validate, check that the CSS is correct. On PHP, look for any weird code. Anyone here know what base 64 is in PHP? When you obfuscate, as they call it, the code, which basically means hide the code that's being executed. If you see that in your theme, it's probably because someone put something bad in there and you don't want to uh, be running that. Um, we sometimes see anything that says file get content or fgets. That means that when the theme is loading, it's actually requesting another page or another file somewhere else on the internet that your visitors having to wait whilst your server goes and gets. That's going to slow things down. So if you see any of that in your theme, think about that as well. Even if you're not a PHP programmer, you can just search for these things and know what's going on. And finally, is your host slow? I mean, I'm without the fact that you know, we obviously host WordPress, but at an abstract level, there comes a point where if your host is just running really old servers, or if there's so many other people sharing the same server that you are, then it might be worth thinking about whether you could get a better deal elsewhere. There's a site called You've Got Signal, um, dot com and they have a service it's called reverse IP checker and what it does is you type in your domain or your IP address of your site and it shows you everyone else that's running on that same IP address on that same server essentially your digital neighbors it's quite interesting to see sometimes how many people you're sharing the server with both in terms of the volume and also sometimes in terms of content you know if there's content that you wouldn't necessarily want to be sharing with so okay, level two, let's just get a little more technical here. Offloading, so we'll talk about CDNs, content delivery networks in a second. That's when you put images and other files that are not core to the page itself, somewhere else so that they'll load faster. And we'll talk about that in a second. But in the meantime, offloading is essentially when you put things like images somewhere else, often on Flickr, so that when someone comes to your site, they download the HTML, the HTML says, ah, I've got loads of photographs now to download. The person visiting your site is now requesting those from Flickr, and your web server is not being taxed anymore. And if someone else comes along, that web server is free to then serve that next person and let Yahoo and Flickr deal with the extra load. Another good thing, similar to that, uh, but with your RSS feed, is Google run FeedBurner. How many people here use FeedBurner? FeedBurner is really good. It essentially points to your RSS feed and pulls in your RSS feed and gives you a new URL at FeedBurner's uh, domain, which in turn you give to your users. And so when they then request an RSS feed, they're requesting it off Google servers and not yours. And that's good because sometimes we see people doing very naughty things where they're requesting your RSS feed every 30 seconds. And if you look at your logs on your server, you might find that more than 50% of your traffic is to your RSS feed. Remember, if you use something like Google Analytics, that's only measuring the human visitors who are running a browser to your site. But search engines, people putting up RSS feeds are all coming along too, and they're not listed in, in Google Analytics. If you get access to your logs on your actual server, you can see quite a lot of your capacity is being used to serve RSS. So why not let Google take care of that for you? Plus they give you statistics and analytics on the RSS, which is quite cool. And again, it's free. This one's interesting. Repair your MySQL database. Without getting into the, the, complex, the complexities of how MySQL databases work, I often say to clients, MySQL is a bit like your bedroom as a teenager. It gets messy, and someone has to come in and clear it up every so often. It just reorganizes things. Um, if you do a lot of deleting of posts, if you create posts and delete them for some reason, or if you use the uh, autosave feature, there's a lot of examples of where stuff gets written to the database and then deleted. That's one of the things that can really uh, slow it down and needs to be optimized. There's a couple of ways of repairing your MySQL database. The most easiest one is probably in the middle here is to download a plugin called Optimize DB, which you just run it and it just every so often runs the re repair command on MySQL, which just organizes everything. If you ever have a, a Windows com uh, computer and you do the defrag, 
I don't know whether they still do that in Windows. I'm an active guy these days. But if you remember defrag, it's a bit like that for your database. If you have PHP MyAdmin access, you can go in and do that. You just click on all of the tables. And then at the bottom there's a drop down and you click repair. If you click drop or empty, it's a bad, bad idea. Don't do that. And if you're super leak, you can log in with SSH and uh, just repair it manually through the uh, MySQL D command in SSH. Browser caching. So WordPress doesn't do a great deal of work of caching out of box. Essentially, if you download the page and you say to the browser, hey, you don't have to download this again. This is fresh for the next couple of minutes. Or in the case of a CSS file or image files, these image files are not going to change. You can just keep them in the cache and the disk cache forever or for a long time. With a number of the uh, caching plugins, they'll automatically add these for you, so you don't have to worry about it. OK, level three, getting a little bit more advanced. So this is using SSH access. So my health warning aside about be careful with SSH. SSH is really cool. I kind of think of it as like the matrix. You know when you see the, uh, you could see, see the, the uh, code. And I would say that if you're, if you're not familiar or not confident with SSH, but you do WordPress work for a living, or you're just really into WordPress, it's worth having a think about improving your SSH skills. Don't do that on your own WordPress account where your live site runs. You can maybe get a test account somewhere. You could download a Linux distribution. But having a go and becoming more familiar with SSH and the commands that you can run on it is a great skill to have in your toolkit. And then if you really, really don't feel confident, some of these optimizations, if it sounds like things that your WordPress site might benefit from, if you don't feel confident doing, your friendly WordPress consultant might help you, uh, or even you might meet people here who can help you. Uh, and so just because you can't do it doesn't mean it's not worth doing, even if it's you know, 100 bucks or whatever to get someone to set some of this up for you. All right, let's dig in. So MySQL is the database that we run with WordPress. And it has a command called log slow query. A slow query is one that takes over a certain amount of time to occur. Usually, I think it's by default on many di uh, distros of Linux, it's 10 seconds. And in a non-web world, maybe 10 seconds is fine if you're doing some big computing thing. In the web, 10 seconds would be ridiculous. Someone's going to close the browser and go on somewhere else by the time they've waited 10 seconds. But maybe one second or two seconds is a good time uh, to say that if anything in your WordPress account or anything of your plugins or your widgets, when someone comes to your site, is causing your MySQL database to take more than a second to perform that query, that's too long. You probably want to find out how you, you know, how and why. So there's a good explanation of how to do that at this URL. You basically go into your configuration file of MySQL. You turn on the log, log slow queries. You say how many seconds you want it to say to quit to log for and then you just let your site run. And after a while, you come back and you look at the, the query log, which is in there, and you can see any queries that take too long. And you can probably, from the query itself, work out what it is that's causing that. Maybe it's a new plugin. Maybe you did a get all posts and randomly search through for the letter A. And if you've got 50,000 posts in your WordPress, it's going to take a while to do that. And you might be able to work out where, what it is that's causing that to happen. You can probably deactivate that plugin or, or widget or whatever and see whether it's still happening. And once you've identified it, you can make a decision as to how you want to handle that. But certainly, if something's taking a second to, to run in your work in your MySQL, it's slowing down your site. There's also some profiling tools that you can use. Um, the debug bug bar plugin is really cool. You know how they added for WordPress 3 the admin bar on the top? Well, you can essentially add to that a debug bar, which if you're developing sites or you really want to know what's going on with your site, it's good to add. It's a plugin. A lot of the core con contributors and automaticians who work for uh, Automatic have built this. Um, it's got some, ex uh, some extra explanation in the uh, file, but basically you add save queries and WP debug into your WP config file and then it begins to offer you lots of profiling information about your site. So it'll tell you how long every query is taking, how long parts of the page are taking to run, and you can basically use that to work out, hey, this is really slow, or my site's really slow, and most of it's just getting ahead of what's going on there. And then you can dig in and work out what it is 
And I would say this is something you should run on a regular basis just to have a look. And certainly if you add a new plugin or a new or upgrade a plugin to a significant new version, you know, you feel like it might be a little slow, just run this and hopefully you can find out what it is that's causing the site to run slowly. Um, if you do a search for debug bar and then Westy, W-E-S-T-I, that's the name of one of the automaticians that wrote the plugin. Um, it has a, if you do that into Google, there is a, uh, a blog post called Introducing WP Debug, which is a great help to on how to get this going. A couple of other tools. Um, WP Engine, we actually run a speed testing tool where you go to speed.wpengine.com, type in your site uh, URL, and we will present you with an independently uh, uh, created um, analysis of how many took your site to load, which parts were slow, and we give you some ideas for optimizations and things that you can do to improve the site. That's free, doesn't require you to be a WP Engine customer, just something that we offer. Why Slow is also a service that's out there. It's run by a company called Yahoo. Does anyone here remember a company called Yahoo? They used to do search or something. I don't know. No, Yahoo's still great, but they, um, they're doing lots of other things, and Why Slow is one of the products that works in a similar way. It's a browser plugin that will analyze your site for you and tell you where it's slow. Worth checking out. Next up is Content Delivery Networks, CDN. The idea of a CDN, for those of you that don't know, is I come to your site, I pull down the HTML because that's what's running on your WordPress. And so once the browser gets the uh, HTML, it's going to say, hey, get this JavaScript file, get this CSS file, get these images. Now, if they were running on your server as well, I've got to get all those as well from your server, which, as I mentioned before, is taxing your server. It's having to go through and send all these files out to that visitor. And if you've got lots of people wanting to visit your site, then that's just using a lot of resources. The idea of a CDN is twofold. You're going to put those files on another server somewhere else automatically, and I'll explain how in a second, so that when someone comes to your site, they're going to then go and point to those files elsewhere, so then your server's left to get on with the next query or the next person coming along. But what it's also doing it, in most CDNs is it's putting those files onto many servers around the world, and through some jiggery pokery with DNS, your user that's visiting your site in London is, pro is probably going to then get served with those files, your images, your JavaScript, your, Im your CSS from a server in the UK, maybe in London. And so it's going to be much quicker for them. And then if you've got another visitor coming from uh, Japan, they might have the same thing, and those, and those, uh, those files are going to then be in uh, Japan. So they're going to be stored in multiple pa uh, places. Um, so there's a couple of ways of achieving that. One of the popular uh, services is a company called Max CDN. I would give the, dis the disclosure that we use them and we offer our clients uh, CDN automatically through Max uh, CDN. Um, if you go and sign up today, if you were to go and buy something with them, I don't make any money. I'm not there for um, affiliating them or anything, but just simply saying it's something we use. A lot of bloggers use them. A lot of sites use them, and it's pretty good. Um, Amazon CloudFront, if you put files on Amazon S3, you can then put their CDN, which is called CloudFront in front of those files, and then they will have the same approach to occur. Then Cloudflare. How many people here use Cloudflare? If you don't know Cloudflare, it's worth checking out. Cloudflare sits in front of your web server, and any request to your site go to them, and then they proxy it to the web server. And they do a number of things. They CDN and cache some of the files. They also check for uh, anyone trying to do anything uh, malicious with your site. Uh, anyone come and kind of scrape your site. And they actually have a free plan that's pretty good, so it's free. And so it's definitely worth checking them out. Again, not making any money or anything if you go with them and buy anything from them. They're just good guys doing some interesting stuff. In the case of all of these, um, there are plugins for WordPress, which you just install, and it automatically sets up. So you go and buy the account, and then you just set your account details to the plugin, and then it automatically sends your files over to their servers and changes the HTML in your site so that then the files are being referenced on their servers. Max CDN have their own plugin. Also, if you're using W3 Total Cache, that has a tab just for CDN. And again, they just want your username and password for the account, and it just goes and does it. You don't have to worry about it. It's pretty cool. CDNs can be expensive, though, and they often want you to buy large amounts of data in, in, uh, in one go. So you might have to buy several terabytes for a couple of hundred dollars, which might last you a year. 
So the brief ads are kind of pay up front. And then once you've got that account, you can either use it all the time to make your site nice and fast, or you can do what's called uh, emergency use, where if your site's going to suddenly get a lot of traffic because you're advertising or you've been heavily linked to or you've ended up on the front page of uh, uh, Reddit, then you can quickly turn it on. And then, of course, you're then eating into your allowance. But then once you're done and the traffic spike's gone, you can turn it off. I'm just going to check how I'm doing for time because I don't have a watch on. Yeah, 15 minutes. Okay, awesome. I'll have some time for questions. So, smash your images. Uh, uh, another Yahoo service is called Smush It. You essentially um, add it to your uh, as a plugin. It takes all of the images in your site and sends them up to Yahoo and compresses them even further. Sometimes when you save out images from Photoshop or wherever you edit your images or your camera, it's actually not the most optimized way that that JPEG or GIF could be, certainly for JPEGs and PNGs, and they will optimize it further without reducing any visual quality and save it back down. And then you don't have to worry. You just install the plugin. It's done. Another thing, and I'm going to not be able to go through this in lots of detail because of time, but when you run the PHP scripts that we were talking about, because it's in a scripting language you can go in and edit at any time, that has to be converted on the fly into what they call interpreted so that the server can then run it and execute it. And that executable code that the server and the CPU actually executes can be saved so that you don't have to keep on saving that out. Uh, uh, sorry, you don't have to keep on it, interpreting that, sorry. Um, APC, alternative PHP, cache is a, uh, a good option. If you run uh, a Linux uh, box running Debian or Ubuntu or one of the Debian flavors, um, you can use PHP-APC uh, under Aptitude, App Install, PHP APC. I'm guessing on CentOS and Red Hat, that's Yum and the same, but I'm not a Red Hat guy. Once you've got that installed, or if that's already installed on your server, if you're running on a, on a shared hosting and then you run W3 Total Cache, again, it'll automatically start uh, caching that off code. Switching to a, a dedicated box for MySQL, if you've got a lot of traffic, is a good idea, where you just put the, the, the MySQL database on another server in the same data center, ideally on the same rack, and then um, you just put inside your WP config file that the database is no longer on localhost, but it's on the local IP address of wherever the database is running. And then that just means that lots of the intensive database querying is then occurring on another server. And that's a good way to get a lot of resource back on the server if you need to do so. Okay, let's just go through some quick, uh, this is hitting the big time. So if you've got a lot of traffic, tens of millions, certainly hundreds of millions, maybe even millions of hits a month, you might want to think about some of this. Reverse proxy with Nginx sounds awful, or a nerdy cocktail. Um, basically, Apache is probably one of the most common web servers to run uh, WordPress at the moment still, and certainly in general. And it's great, but it's not necessarily the fastest web server for, store, for sending out those cached static files that we've been talking about. Nginx uh, is a good alternative. Um, you can also run PHP to that, but it's not the way that we do it at WP Engine. You can set things up in a way where you put Nginx as your main web server that your users and visitors access, and then any of those cached files that we talked about just get served through N uh, Nginx, and you can serve so much more of the throughput per second with Nginx, it's crazy, and then that's a good way of getting uh, that, that throughput that you need. And then any files that are not cached that the PHP and WordPress needs to be executed for, it then passes it back, what's called the reverse proxy, to Apache that's running still on the web server but not accessible externally, normally on port 8080. Again, there's a good uh, explanation at wpperformance.com. So we talked about caching. You can use something called Varnish Cache, which is actually a, 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 a self-installed uh, caching service for Linux that you would run on your box. And essentially, with um, the uh, reverse proxy, any of those files that you don't want to cache will then be saved to disk. And then uh, Nginx can be told to check to see whether there's any files that uh, Varnish has already saved to disk. And if so, it'll, it'll serve those out of the Varnish cache instead of putting them through to the uh, Apache. It's kind of complicated to set up, but it's worth doing. Again, um, do Google it. There's lots of, including on the official Varnish cache website, there's lots of good how to's. Um, and then also memcache. Memcache is similar, but it stores files and objects in disk. Um, you can set it up to, to store 
end cache files that you've served just from, disk, from, from uh, uh, memory, which means that it's even quicker than serving it from disk. Memcache will also, if you have it installed, and you run something like W3 Total Cache, will ensure that the objects that come out of the database that WordPress is requesting are also cached, so then you have another tier of, of uh, caching going on there. So if WordPress gets things out of the database, it'll store that in memcache and won't need to keep going back to the database to get them uh, uh, quite so frequently. And the times and, and, how, and how long that should stay for is all taken care of for you. Um, there's also a nice plugin called WP Memcache Manager. So if memcache is running on your server or you install it, you can run that as a plugin within WordPress and it will tell you as a snapshot what's going on within memcache uh, at any time so you can see what's being cached. HyperDB, if you've got lots of databases, at this point you're in, you're in huge amounts of, of traffic. HyperDB is something that Automatic wrote that you swap out for the regular database adapter and will let you run multiple databases across multiple servers. Um, worth checking out, again, if you've got lots of database servers already and you need failover, but then you're probably in, in uh, an excellent shape if you really need to do that. All right, just a few things. Uh, boss level as it were. If you get so much traffic or you're anticipating so much traffic, it's going to be insane. There are plugins that will save your entire site to disk and send it over to S3, Amazon S3. And because you can now serve full sites from Amazon S3, it's a great choice if you're going to get so much traffic that you, won't, you know you won't be able to handle it for a short amount of time. Anything dynamic like commenting or anything like that, you'll either have to disable or use a JavaScript based system like Discus or Intense Debate. But this, we, we've used this a couple of times on clients where they're literally going on TV to talk about their uh, site and you have no idea how much traffic they're going to get because you can basically not bring down Amazon S3, they have so much capacity. So um, if you've ever used movable type back in the dark ages before you moved to WordPress, it works in a similar way where you would save out files to uh, disk um, and this is a similar kind of model. Two fails, ha 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 however, to look out for. Number one, don't edit any core files. I see all the time in forums, people write, hey, if you edit this core file, it'll make your WordPress more optimized. Probably not true. And even if it is, when you then go to upgrade, which of course you're upgrading all the time, I'm sure, you're going to overwrite that change anyway. So don't edit any core files. And if there is a true optimization, uh, uh, commit it back to core anyway. And secondly, uh, Amazon EC2. So, I don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but Amazon EC2 is awesome for a lot of types of web apps. Ones where you need to keep opening and closing or, 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 or uh, uh, creating and shutting down instances throughout the day or throughout the week based on load to your site. And then you can distribute that through. Zingri use that a lot for the games that they're offering. Lunchtime, end of work, they can open up more servers and then close them back down during the, the off-peak. But for WordPress, given that it runs usually on a single server that you constantly run, Amazon EC2 is not a great place to put that. I've got five more minutes. Thank you. I'm wrapping up. So uh, if you can run it on there, but the other downside with Amazon is that any time an instance can go down, and then you have to account for that. So it just doesn't seem like for the type of profile of site, uh, sorry, the, the, the profile of the needs of a WordPress site, I don't think Amazon EC2 is a great place to put WordPress. BPS is a good alternative if you're in that range. That's me done. Thank you very much. And I'll take some questions in the five minutes I have. Uh, just to say, this presentation is online if you want to download it. I also have a video of me giving this presentation at a former WordCamp, um, WordCamp t uh, on WordPress TV if you want to see this again or show it to a colleague. And we're giving everyone here a free WP Engine account for life. No strings, no credit cards, no contracts. Um, just feel free to visit that site. One per, per person, please. But it's a $29 a month account that we're just giving to everyone. So uh, with that in mind, I'll take any questions. Thank you. This gentleman here had his hand up very quickly now. Yes. You would, with a CDN, you essentially, they would give you a different domain that all your files are going to run under, and then you might want to set up cdn.yourdomain.com to point to that, to make it look nice. Um, 
you uh, would then have to go through all of your themes, and anywhere where you write images, you would have to say cdn.yourdomain.com. So do you? Yeah, and if you use the image gallery uh, for the image, the, the media uploader, you, and then you save out the, the uh, images into your and insert them into your post, every time you have to go through and edit them. Whereas the plugin is just going to take care of that. Plus, if you ever switch away and don't want the CDN, the plugin's going to stop rewriting those URLs, and so they're not going back to them normally. Whereas if you've been writing them away, suddenly it might break. No, it's just easy to get them. Um, this lady in the front had a question. Oh, I'm being asked to use the microphone. Uh, when you have users that are uploading content, mm -hmm. um, have you found that there's a better CDN um, process than another? I've got some very non-technical users sure. that have to upload content. Only. No, in fact, and, and are you mean to upload content? Do you just mean to WP content uploads, or do you mean into the media browser gallery? No, actually, we were, we're using a file based system for them to upload. It's a right. system. Right. They're uploading lesson plans right. and all kinds of things, no, it, but it's, it's all over the place. Most of them, and most of the plugins will simply, you'll simply say um, that you uh, upload into specific di directories mm -hmm. and below, and then it knows the CDN those files as well. Yeah. How much more time do I have, sir? Four minutes. Um, I'll, I'll let you pick people and I'll just take the questions. Uh, I know you talked earlier about how uh, how you source out the with the images to Flickr yes. as, a, as a recommendation. Um, I do some websites for our school district, uh -huh. and one of the issues we're running into right now is that we have we're trying we have a lot of users uploading PDF files like school newsletters that are well beyond the, the, the two meg limit. Sure. And first off, I was wondering, is there a way to, is there a plugin to fix that, or is there somewhere else where we should be putting our larger PDF documents? So you're hitting the limit of the web server that says there's a two meg limit. Yeah, yeah, right. So that's being set by your web host. So you should A, talk to them and say, can I upload more files? It might be for all of the abuse reasons that they're stopping yeah. that. Yeah, I think it's in, it's actually in our WordPress. If we have our, our own uh, in-house uh, multi oh, okay. and try to find a way to change um, that. Well, the best way of doing it otherwise is to give them FTP or SFTP access and let them upload it that way, probably, to the web server. But you also could use a third-party service, like S3 or something like that, uh, like that where you know the costs of S3 are so small like, I know people that upload things in a similar to a school district, and they're literally paying like $2 a month to store and surf those files. And then you know, there's lots of sites out there and applications that you can run to just drop a file and it'll go off and put it in your S3 bucket and give you the URL to then put it in your WordPress post. Okay, so they do it through S3 and then they can support them. Yeah. People get scared of S3 because they charge on a per file and per access basis, but it's like 0 0.0001 cents per access. So literally two bucks a month. It's you know it's 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 a, no, a no brainer. It's a so, like that. So basically, we wouldn't want to have larger PDFs right in our WordPress install. No, I mean technically they're not running on the WordPress install because they're just going and being saved on the web server and using it as a convenient way. I'm just saying, you know, having them go up onto the web server via like SFTP or Amazon S3 is a good option. I think rather than doing it through WordPress. Any more questions? A couple of people at the back, and uh, the last one, so I don't know where. Um, my question is decided to uh, uninstall an unused plug. Mm -hmm. What if you're running a multi site and you have like 15 sites, and only one site requires like five plugins, and like other sites can't use that plugin? Yeah, then you need to keep it, otherwise. Okay, yeah. You don't recommend like moving to a single list? Well, are other sites well, I personally, so I personally, unless you're, for example, a very specific use case, like a, a university institution or a, or a company that wants to give each each employee a WordPress account, sorry, a WordPress blog, but within a standard shell of the same plugins and the same themes, then that's a good reason to use multi-site. If lots of different sites are running different things completely, like a fishing site and then a tech company site and a restaurant site, if you're running multi-site for that reason, I don't think that's the best practice use. So if everything's running different needs with different plugins, you probably shouldn't be running multi-site in the first place. You probably just want to split those out into separate instances. So I think that's my last question, but I'm, so WP Engine has a little table at the back in the main room, 
We're giving away everyone t-shirts and stickers as well, so you're more than welcome to come by and ask me or any of my staff any questions you want anyway. Plus there's the happiness bar. So with that I will close. Thank you very much.